So uh, just a reminder to everybody, although you've probably all heard the spiel, that this is the uh, Performance Art Daily. It's a, kind of, it's a project of the Toronto Free Gallery, which is the gallery we're in right now. It's a kind of satellite program of the festival um, to give an opportunity for people to have a more, the public in general, although it seems to be mostly artists who are in the festival, and that's fine too, but a chance to have the kind of dialogue that we as artists get you know, in the bar afterwards or at dinners, that kind of thing. Um, but have a chance to talk more intimately with the artists uh, about their work and, and about their situation. Um, and we're very pleased with the way it's been going so far. It is being taped and will all end up eventually on the, uh, on the web. So hopefully it will also be a lot kind of lasting resource and conversation for, uh, for others to access for whatever research purposes they want. Um, this particular project was funded by the Canada Council Special Assistance for Performance Art Fund. So, I think that's enough with introductions. I'm Paul Couillard. Tanya Mars was supposed to be hosting today, but uh, she decided that her time would be better spent cooking dinner for the artists. <laughs> so she's left me in charge. So unfortunately, you won't get the, the, the wisdom of our, one of our senior artists today. You're stuck with me. Um, my name is Paul Couillard, uh, and I'm on the board of Toronto Free Gallery and one of the members of the 7A11D Collective. So, um, our three panelists today are Robin Brass from Saskatchewan, uh, part of the Soto tribe, is that correct? Yeah, it's an Indian. And uh, oh, they won't get it. Soto Nation. Soto Nation. Uh, Maurice Block, uh, Dutch artist living in Finland and Brian Connolly from Northern Ireland. Um, I wanted to start today maybe a little bit differently than the way the other talks have gone. Um, I thought it would be interesting to start by asking the artists something about where they come from, where they're situated in their own places and communities because you know we are from very far-flung kind of groups and Toronto, we, what we know is Toronto. So, so, and, and a sort of little sense of the international scene. But, but it seems to me you all work in very particular contexts and particular regions, et cetera. So I thought it would be interesting to start with that. So Robin, if you don't mind, if we open with you. Um, I know you were living in northern Saskatchewan and have recently moved to Regina. So maybe you can talk a bit about what your situation is like where you live. OK. Um. Well, I'm actually uh, born and raised in a city called Regina, Saskatchewan, which is out on ice, well, inner Canada, the great, the, the plains, uh, uh, the prairies, and um, I've been there. My well, I've been in the province my entire life. I've lived there my entire life. Um, I'm also. Uh, uh, of um, a member of Papixis First Nation, which is a Cree and Soto uh, community, and um, and Anishinaabe, Soto and Anishinaabe were just a, a Western sort of extension of what they call out here the Anishinaabe <coughs> people, um, and uh, um, the community out there, Saskatchewan's always had a really, for many, many years, a really wonderfully supportive uh, environment, but generally speaking, quite supportive of artists um, as a whole. In 1947, I think it was, they, the provincial government established the first uh, provincial arts funding body. It was the first one in the country. Um, and so for many, many years it was, you could, and, and it was cheap. No, everybody ignored us. Nobody liked Saskatchewan from anywhere else in Canada. You know, they drove through it. <laughs> Where are you from? Oh yeah, I've, I've driven through there. <laughs> and it was nice because we could do a lot. You know, I mean, it was that sort of isolation and creativity uh, that, and, and freedom and sort of that came. Uh, and I'm also, but it was probably about a little over 20 years ago, uh, there started to be, I guess you could say the next generation of, well that's kind of maybe the third wave sort of generation of uh, uh, really sort of critically engaged and 
uh, indigenous artists who were really sort of pushing their way into the, the, the larger art world and about 20 years ago and I got, I got on board with that pretty quick um, <clears throat> and became involved ba basically doing a lot of organizing, founding and co-founding of a couple of different indigenous run organizations um, like a uh, what we would call a provincial cultural organization, province-wide based, uh, representative of a lot of different disciplines and practices. And we produced a wonderful magazine, which only came out three times. I mean, we had three issues and then it died. But it was really cutting edge and groundbreaking. I don't know if you know that one, Paul, um, Talking Stick magazine. If oh, yeah. yeah. It was, it was, and, and we were just flying by the seat of our pants, right? Nobody had ever done this before, but um, lots of beautiful things came out. And that, the organization that that came from, which I was chair of at the time, eventually we sort of uh, self-destructed and blew each other up. And <laughs> but we dispersed then into three, well, basically it birthed three indigenous-run, artist-run centers in the province, which is unheard of anywhere basically in the world. One in the northern part of the province, called Wapaman, which no longer functions, or maybe they function, they just sort of do project-based stuff uh, a few times, you know, every few years, I don't know. Uh, one in Saskatoon, which I'm sure many of you might be aware of, the director there is Lori Blondo, performance artist, and that's called Tribe Inc. And then the other one in, in Regina, which is called Sakewewak Artist Collective, and the, uh, the director there is Elwood Chimmy. So I've been very involved in sort of then co-founding the Sakewewak and my, um, where I'm from, where I'm located. So heck of a lot of organizing, heck of a lot of behind the scenes, scenes stuff. Uh, three years, you know, of volunteer kind of work, grant writing, administrative, community building, and um, and then my own pro and and also very much connected, always in my work, always in my process, with intergenerationally and really going after the old people. And uh, I'm kind of like an elder stalker. <laughs> and described as. But, you know, you got to show up and keep knocking, and then the good stuff comes. So I do that too. So in, in terms of the work you do in your own community, it's very, it seems very much based on... Uh, supporting and promoting indigenous uh, art activity, and I'm wondering if you're thinking also in terms of who you're trying to reach as a as an audience. Uh, absolutely. I mean, that was a, that's a big factor for me. Always has been. I, I get really annoyed with uh, with uh, you know people that don't meet deadlines for promotional stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you have to. So for me, the getting whatever you're doing out there and getting it. Out the, the word out in as many ways and forms possible, so and your audience. And I was really, re I worked very hard, and a number, you know, other people as well. For me, it was a real sort of personal goal, though, of trying to uh, bring some sort of new life into, particularly, yes, indigenous people. I mean, not it was for everybody. It's always for everybody, right? But me, I have a really, really heartfelt sort of vested interest in. Uh, First Nations people and our communities as in society as a whole, societies as a whole, and trying to bring them into understanding some more critical thinking and critical engagement in what is culture, what is you know an artistic practice, and how that can really sort of transform you know our our, our lives, hopefully politically, socially. Yeah. Yeah, this. I'd like to get back to that as as the discussion goes on in terms of this sense of. Um, the communities that we develop through our work and using a contemporary kind of practice, uh, for example, to, to uh, help invigorate and to assert uh, an ongoing traditional culture. I think that's a really interesting point that we can get into later, but I, it would also be nice, I think, to hear a little bit about the other artists in the communities they work in first. So let's move on to Maurice. Yeah, I live in a very small place uh, in Finland. Uh, it's uh, Finland's fourth biggest city, and it has a population of 100,000 people. Uh, I lived there since 2005, and it's a very quiet community, I think, although performance art has a, uh, is, is quite a big scene, I think, in Finland. There are many different groups uh, scattered around the country which organize. And um, yeah, when I moved there in 2005, I think in 2006, I became part of one of those. Um, 
which already existed. And they called it uh, a pair, which stands for a poor artists in residence. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and depending on the funding, we did it without funding for a long time. And then we had some good times, I think, where we had uh, quite, nah, yeah, quite a lot of funding. It's nothing compared to this, but enough funding to get things going. And um, we had uh, monthly events where we presented five people on an evening, four, maybe four or five. And, um, well, during my time we had twice a festival, which I'd like to call an event as well, <laughs> um, which was over two or three days and we presented like between 20 and 30 people, so it was really a lot, really a lot. But since about a year or two ago, I think that kind of bled to death. We did that with a group of four and we were the volunteers, you know, there was just the four of us. And two moved out, and uh, yeah, the, 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 the founder, I, I would say, is kind of burned out at the moment. So from time to time, I kind of poke him, that can we not, uh, but then he points at me, and um, you know, I'm not going <laughs> to do that alone anymore. So. Yeah, that, that's practically where I come from, far away countryside. Yeah, uh, and I think that's a common thing, this evolution of groups and, and how they change even in terms of the 7A, 11D festival. The first festival we did, it was 14 artists who organized it. Then the second festival, this was before we realized we couldn't do it every year, was seven artists. And that was a huge drop. And we actually did a kind of two festivals. We did one in the summer and one in the fall. It was a two-part festival. So then we said, okay, we can't do this anymore. <laughs> and you know, the collective evolved over time and, and different members have come in and gone. But that drop from 14 to 7 was quite dramatic, so I can see a drop from 4 to 2 would probably be <laughs> disastrous, <laughs> obviously. But uh, I'm wondering just in terms of how connected, as an artist who's not originally from Finland, being in Finland, do you feel, do you feel you're an outsider? Do you feel you're really part of that community, or how does that work? No, nah, I feel part of that community. I think it's really easy to uh, be an outsider in Finland in general, like no matter where you're from. But... Um, yeah, of course you connect with the people, and I think uh, as there's uh, for such a small country, I mean there live five million people in in Finland. I think the population of Toronto is bigger than than, but there are there are. Your game there are maybe eight associations slash organizations, uh, you know, qu quite a lot anyway. So there's a lot of people that come around and go around, and you meet them from time to time, and we have uh, informal talks. Um, yeah, and see what people do. So in that sense, it's it's not really difficult. But um, yeah, you you often have to travel for that. And I live in Lahti, which is a a city which is a one hour drive from Helsinki. So I'm rather centrally based, so to speak. But the people that are up north in the country, it will take them six or seven hours to to come to to see what's going on. And for a weekend event, they will not do that, uh, obviously. So in a way you're isolated, but if uh, yeah, it's always your own decision. Now, so you can be part of it if you want. Great. Uh, now I'll move on to to Brian. Uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about the context that you work in, and yeah. you know. Okay. Where you well, I, I live in Northern Ireland, um, part of Ireland, and um, <laughs> um, as a geological geographical structure. Um, I, I grew up in Northern Ireland and pretty much during the Troubles, uh, most of my memories are of, of, of things happening in your local area and um, that really is, uh, I think, informed so much of my thinking and experience um, and th uh, seeing so much uh, opposition and contradiction and uh, I suppose just negative views of the other, has really informed so much of my thinking in, in trying to find some way between these things or looking for a way of being that in no way kind of would add to this kind of negative kind of opposition. So that, that was a background really to the form, formation of, of, of my thinking or, or my, my experience. Uh, I grew up in the country, uh, part of a Protestant community and I uh, went to Belfast Art College and met quite a range of others, like minds, and um, from both communities. And that helped to um, kind of affirm a lot of my thinking and um, 
enabled me to kind of keep going as a practitioner. And since leaving uh, college in the 80s, um, I kept living in Belfast for a good number of years through pretty bleak times um, in the city and in the, in the troubles and working as a, mainly as a sculptor and installation artist at that period and developing from that eventually into testing performance art, I think in the early 90s. You know, and it seemed at the time a very big step, but a very short step as well from what I'd been actually doing. Uh, having done that, then I started to work with artists like Alistair MacLennan, there was Nick Stewart and uh, Brian Kennedy, other, other Northern Irish artists at the time. And we started to organise little projects, or not so little, but one-off projects, maybe one every two years. Um, we had, you know, had to just, like everyone else, apply for funding. And bringing internationals in, in artists into the context and presenting work in different um, cities, Derry and Belfast. And um, testing contexts, bringing artists into different communities or different locations and presenting live work, performance, installation, whatever. And um, during the 90s, I lived in Dublin for a few years, um, working there, and then came back to Belfast to live. And then got a teaching post in the city of Belfast, uh, part-time teaching there still. And then got married, well, had kids, got married, <laughs> uh, and moved to the country, where I still live today, uh, back in the north of Ireland. And we, I organize still events with an organization called Be Beyond, um, who have become quite active in the last five years in Belfast and Northern Ireland. Um, really down to people like Brian Patterson, who's the backbone of that organization. And uh, you know, without who, I don't think it would be, be there. How many artists are involved in BPM? There's a committee at the minute, I think about eight. Um, you know, and it's an international committee by, you know, by chance as much as anything else. We have, on the committee, we have Alistair McLennan, myself, Brian Patterson, um, Elvira Santa Maria, um, Sinead Brennach Cashel, uh, Reiner Pagel, and Kasha uh, Pagel, uh, Hugh O'Donnell, Colm Clark, and forgive me anyone who I've forgotten. <laughs> um, but all who you know, have come through performance and we're trying as an organisation to keep the younger artists involved and bringing more younger artists in because I feel like I'm old now and should be standing back a little and letting others do the things they want rather than trying to set up uh, projects that I want to do. All of, um, so I'm standing back at this point a little bit to see what happens mm -hmm. and to see if anyone else can step in and, and uh, do other things, both for family reasons as well, mm -hmm. for, as well as age reasons. But I, I think part of the, I know it's particularly true of uh, Be Beyond and it sounds like it's true also of Maurice's uh, efforts, that the idea of it being international and really having a lot of artists from different places uh, exchanging with local artists seems to be a, an important aspect. Of yeah, uh, Be Beyond, we set out to kind of bring, bring work in. It was, you know, we didn't want just to be kind of presenting work to ourselves. Uh, we wanted to bring work from all, as, as many places in the world as we can afford or to do, uh, with the idea of then of perhaps giving opportunities to younger artists to go to other places. Uh, also trying to get the sense of younger artists getting experience with, with their work and experience in other places, but that they would then get experience of organising and you know, helping something to develop. <laughs> in Ireland in general, there's, um, it's a, almost like a peripatetic or a staggered history of, of performance activity. Um, there's projects have happened in Cork in the past and Limerick and you know, now that's changed and it's moved to Galway and there's mm -hmm. artists now in Dublin working and setting up projects. So it's, it's never really developed like in Canada, a strong network because I think it's just been too small so far. Um, and, and it's perhaps a little bit like Finland in the sense that there's people coming and going and it's quite hard to establish a very strong network in that. But at the minute, I think it's stronger than it has been for about 15 years. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more happening now. And uh, Robin, I wonder if that, that, uh, that sense of connecting with other communities has been important with you as well. I know groups like Tribe and City or Walk have tried to connect with indigenous communities and other places, that sort of thing as well. I don't, is, that a, is, is that important to you in terms of developing your community? Or? Well, I mean, for me, uh, just personally, yeah. Absolutely, um, and uh, 
should say that what I was describing earlier, I mean, a lot of that was past work for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sort of been in more, uh, not so directly involved with those earlier sort of things Focusing I was describing. Focusing on your own art practice. <clears throat> Yeah, and other things in life. <laughs> <laughs> Focusing on living. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Trying to stand up. <clears throat> um, so. <laughs> I know that feeling. <laughs> <laughs> Taking a couple years to stand up. And, um, well, you know, it's, we're in, uh, like, say, say, the organization that I've been really, really involved with over the years, which was Sagewewak. I mean, we've been around for, ele for 11 years. It's a uh, non-profit. It's been around for 11 years. You know, all First Nations run um, artists. And uh, we have a festival, an annual festival. Um, uh, that's, this was, it's coming up its 10th year <clears throat> now. And, but in our presence, in our community, I mean, we're always engaging and interacting, you know, with, the, with, with you know, the broader community and other artist-run centers and organizations and co-presenting and co-producing with, with other, you know, art, art, artists and, uh, you know, and non-profits. And so we're, there's, there's constant, uh, you know, working together with, with, you know, not just Indigenous people, for sure. Yeah, I guess and that's significant, you know, and that's something sometimes people will say, well, I thought you'd just work with each other. Or I thought you'd just, you know, it's about, a lot of it's just about, you know, voice and power and position who's, who's, you know, making decisions and what's truly collaboration and that nature then, you know. Yeah, I was also thinking in terms of, you know, you had mentioned, oh, Saskatchewan's a place that people thought you just drive through it to get <laughs> to the other end of the country kind yeah. of thing. So that yeah, sense of maybe feeling isolated as a community or, or that, you know, you're, mm. that wanting to be connected? Oh, oh, no, it's a wonderful thing. It's a good thing, and it's kind of a bit of a joke, really, you know. I mean, they, <laughs> people do go there. In some ways, it's like the Bermuda Triangle. The ones that do show up, they like it and they stay, so. <laughs> 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 you always want to come back, so. Yeah, we, and so for sure, it's, it's both, but there's always been that, uh, that aspect of, of, of working um, with, with with people, you know, across the country, into the states, and um, and sometimes internationally. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just that we really were investing a lot more of our time, though, into our own communities because nobody else was doing that anyway. All, even though they were getting public funding to do so, supposedly, right? Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> <laughs> a slightly political comment there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, but I want to go back, I was struck by something that Brian said when he was uh, sort of setting up his, his history. And I, and I should say that, you know, now that we've kind of introduced all the panelists, you should feel free to jump in if you, something, something catches you that you want to pursue as, a, as an audience, please, you know, it's an open discussion. It's not just me up here pointing fingers at people and saying, you, what do you have to say about that? Um, but Brian was mentioning that Part of his investment, it's, if I understood correctly, part of your investment in art was about not wanting to find a way of being in the world that wouldn't be contributing to uh, the troubles and the ongoing sort of sort of conflict. Yeah, I think it was. Um, uh, I don't know a, a personal view or a family view, personal view experience. Um, just not wanting to. Um, be partisan, I suppose, or, or drawn mm -hmm. to one particular point of view. And that really informed a lot of the work that I did in the 80s and early 90s. The idea of opposition or, you know, I've actually used optics, as some of you have experienced. And that has come out of that idea of having two points of view and um, that it's possible to combine the two views of something in one's mind. So that, that kind of thinking has always been in the background. In, in some of the work, um, but um, I, I, I think just having having come through it and looked at it and just seeing how negative and damaging uh, opposition, political opposition of that nature was in our location. Uh, to this day, there's still that legacy. Um, a, a little change, but there's still people who are wanting to drag it back. Um, to uh, almost no-win positions at this stage. 
Um, and I didn't want to be part of one side or that or the other. And a lot of people maybe didn't have choices, you know, they maybe in their community, they, they had to either stay, do, take a particular standpoint or leave, you know. Um, and I was lucky, I think, in that sense that I was living in the country and beyond that. Um, but I was talking to uh, a few other artists just about the different uh, possibilities of um, the political mm -hmm. uh, vacuum that occurred or a political kind of narrowing of space from which you can operate in. You're, you're actually, the room is almost emptied of air in some times to actually breathe. And it's very hard to operate as an artist sometimes within that, what kind of language you can use or, or you know, what are the kind of ways you can actually mediate or relate um, across boundaries. And, and I've t attempted to do that since, since the 80s. Yeah, I, I want to, just before we get to Andrew, I, I wanted to link that with, I was thinking of a comment that I heard a few years ago that Riona Brass, actually Robin's sister, who's also a performance artist, made at an Aboriginal art conference where she was saying one of the reasons she thought performance art was particularly strong and a useful tool within, the, within specifically the First Nations community is that she felt that with performance art she could find a language that was not sort of overwhelmed by colonialism, that, what, that it had more than just the overtones of colonialism, and linking that, and to hear you say, you know, being an artist seemed to be a way to sidestep, uh, you know, Surely. And I uh, think some in addition to those troubles that, that <coughs> I, I'm just wondering curiously about how all of the panelists would think in terms of art and specifically performance art as, as how do we end up here? Does it, does it actually help us to maneuver in a different way or to speak our own language or to, to uh, you know, what's the potential power of performance art? Why is it so many artists end up in this field? <laughs> it's, That's a a it's, it's an interesting and very difficult question to answer because um, in reality for myself I have uh, worked in th possibly three different ways of performing mm -hmm. um, uh, which are like almost tactical uh, choices in the sense of what, what events are or what are the contexts for things so I take different choices of what I can actually do in a situation uh, based on the context or the nature of the event um, but it's very hard to um, you know, say consciously how that decision was made in relation to politics or mm -hmm. to social history. Uh, I think I arrived at it through practice process uh, rather than coming at it as a political decision, I think. Um, uh, and maybe just using then that tool in time, understanding it more as a having potential voice or voices to say hopefully some political things, mm -hmm. my views of politics. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm curious to know whether and how and you know whether the audience sees your work and sees you, to between the two different opposing forces. Um, it depends which works um, that would occur. But in, in some of the installation work that I would have worked with in Northern Ireland, or I was dealing with optics and uh, presenting very literally two points of view so that you were looking at uh, maybe the piece was a pair of binoculars which you saw to the left and to the right so there were particularly two distinct <coughs> images which you were seeing and they combined in your mind you know when you looked so in some ways i was de literally dealing with the opposition as a way of as an, as a metaphor to try and bring that into the mind as a possibility to see together. So the spatial decision was part of the work, to use the space, to bring it together in the mind, literally. So maybe we can go to the other, about this big P versus small P politics and all of this question of what? Could you repeat the question? I, I don't know. If it, it doesn't have to even. Oh, but it was more like, it. how did we come to perform? If I that, that was correct, part of right? it, but also I, I thought specifically it seemed there was something important about the idea, as Brian was talking about it, that somehow performance art allowed a way, not of neutrality, but a way of sort of stepping outside some of the more uh, difficult 
tensions and, and, and side taking? A narrowing of, of possibility. And narrowing of perspective and possibility? No, yeah, maybe for me, uh, narrowing the way of possibilities, it's also um, very much not concrete, I think. I mean, it's not a painting or an object which you can walk around. Um, and that's for me really interesting, actually. And I came from uh, making objects to um, doing short actions, which I recorded on a video camera. And then I was watching people watching me and thought that this is not, you know, I could be my part of that. Um, and then it was like a small step to, to perform in front of an audience, to work these things out a little bit better. And I like actually very much that it's not so concrete, for me anyway, that I can really play uh, with it. That I don't have, a, I mean, I know that there's a time, there's a space, there's a beginning, there's an ending. And uh, that, that for me is, um, is enough. That's enough. I say with loads of confidence. <laughs> <laughs> Did you want to jump in, Robin? I, I know Jürgen has a question he wants to. I don't. I don't have much to say other than it's just. It's just the great. It's just such a, a great playground. Mm -hmm. You know. I just feel it's just a completely natural thing for my personality, and I'm sure many other people's, and my way of thinking, and which I didn't have the language or the labels for earlier, but you just you know, swam in it, in it in one way or another. And so and then, you know, it, it, the same things that these two fellows said. When you got started, what you were doing, did you know it was performance art? Were you thinking about no. that? No, 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 no. Absol ab absolutely not. No. So how did you just <laughs> start making things, start doing things? <laughs> uh, uh, well, it was always... Uh, uh, talk or storytelling, you know, standing up at the dinner table and couldn't finish my meal and talking nonstop. And when I was about 10, my dad told me, you are going to be a storyteller. So it was this idea of, of always be a very, I have a hard time sitting still, just being, have to get into things, always getting into things. Um, um, I think another thing probably, I was always had to be in a lot of therapy as a kid, like physical therapy and speech therapy for many years and end up in surgery. So there, at an early age, I was in a lot of biofeedback kind of processes. So there was this internal world and creative thing. And I think that had a big uh, sort of influence in some ways. But I don't know. It's just, you know, I just well, like to play. Used the word it's play. a playground. Yeah, that, you know, that word play, I think, is very important. And uh, um, going back to Be Beyond, we're trying to work with groups now in the sense of like every month the artists meet very regularly and just you know whoever can go goes and just they pick a spot and they start to perform and it's like play and it allows people just to test things or you know, come up with invention and to relate to the other and uh, it's, it's great it's very interesting for anybody who it's a it's a great resource I think to, to find out things and to, to test out new ideas but play is very important we don't do enough of that so Andrew I know you were trying to get in earlier I don't no, no, no. I, in fact, it's a, uh, no, Andrew was sorry. Andrew was also oh, sorry, before no, no, no. earlier. So, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry. Well, when I just feel like when Brian, in particular, but about the stuff about sort of like a binarism, the ability to see two sides. I was thinking like, well, you also see performance, a performative discourse or performativity, as being a way of maybe opening up third and maybe even fourth or fifth or sixth spaces and getting outside of binary structures. Um, I, think it, I think that's where you went. Yes, I think it did. Uh, I started to realize the binary doing installation, you know, that, that there, there was a third option or fourth option. And um, it kind of opened up then into trying to open up a various points of view uh, or perspectives in things. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, you can go ahead. No, no, no. I think, uh, no, uh, I know, in fact, I'm, I'm aware that an artist should not speak um, uh, about his art. <laughs> but, you know, I'm really interested in, in fact, the same question, and it uh, comes with your question, in fact. So it's nearly the same what Paul uh, asked already, but I'm especially interested, uh, like I told yesterday, in quality. And uh, so I'm interested, if you have an idea, maybe not, 
uh, if you have an idea what is for you the special quality of performance art, so why oh, why not going to dance, why not video, of course it has mostly historical because I'm coming from this, but if you have an idea, it would, I would love it, <coughs> why performance art, why not, what is the special quality you can have? Only find in this art form. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, Maybe. Yeah. It, it, again, because it, I, I don't know if I'm. But you can get us going. I hope. Um, for me, because I work in different ways with performances, there's slight variations in, in how I think well, about the form of the performance. But yesterday's performance in public is quite different because of the audience and the context. So what I get from that or the experience of that is the interaction, the, the attempt to interact and get feedback and to kind of make a, a little intervention in a sense into the thinking or into the moment of time with someone. So for me, that's one of the attempts in that work. And also for me, the risk of that interaction you know, what might happen and mm. the experience of that. Um, but if I'm thinking of <coughs> maybe different performances, the risk is a higher, <coughs> a higher element of things not, you know, just how, how it works, you know, how do I deal with the situation and being in that moment and that live experience of what happens, you know, how do I make decisions, how, how can I, you know, keep this clarity or this aesthetic honesty in place with the integrity of, of trying to do this thing in that live moment. So those are the things I, I kind of respond to. But I also want to communicate. I want the work to communicate and, and translate across as many boundaries as I can. And um, it's up to people to come to it, I think, to, to receive it. You know, quite subtle sometimes. So. I think uh, yeah, I, I, uh, it's it's a very good question, and I, I consider I think about this very often myself too, and I, I very often cannot answer the question that when I see something and it's and I think it's good to think in terms of bad or good or because maybe they are irrelevant, but um, of course when it feels right. Uh, yesterday we talked about this as well. When when the circle is round, and when the interest has been kept. When, uh, but this is very close to me because performance is just a word and it includes so many different things. But when a performance is built up out of different actions which uh, take place, uh, which, which uh, um, when people use certain objects, it raises expectations. And when I'm uh, surprised because it is not what I think where it's heading to, for me that's a, that's a very good thing, I think. Mm. And I like to be uh, confused, uh, very much, but somehow <coughs> things need to fall in place. Um, and if it does that because of repetition or because of the use of certain objects in a specific context, in a specific place, with, I think that for me makes, makes a, a good performance. But that is very much um, thinking of a performance which involves these objects and different actions and and it doesn't mean that uh, a durational piece which is um, doesn't include any objects at all but maybe just a gesture can can also be good I think um, but I, I will re uh, for me that is uh, it's very difficult for me to be judgmental about it it's more like an emotion or a feeling that I think yeah this is this is right and don't ask me why so, yeah. Um, so you sort of like had a two-part question. It was like, what is good performance art in sort of my mind, or what? Uh, yeah, he wants to know what's good. But <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't quite. Can re you know, repeat your question, please, Jurgen? No, uh, only one word. If you have an, uh, it's, it's important for you, or if you have an approach uh, to mm. why, uh, what is. It, for me, you know, always I'm thinking about what what is a question of quality of performance. It's an un unanswerable question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can't answer it. So mm -hmm. yes. You can only speak about it and think about it. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And so I just wonder if you are, you are, you are a performance artist. Um, um, how, how does this uh, thing, why maybe, why not dance, why not painting, why? Right. So why is it special do you choose to do this performance? Well, I think that the way, I, when I was uh, about, I don't know, about 18 or 19 years old, I remember, you know, you at that time you have to choose your sort of what direction you're going to start studying or what are you going to do. And at that point in my life, um, I was r- really wanting to, 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 to find, I didn't know what it was that I was looking for, but I knew that there was something about in indigenous knowledge and indigenous knowledge systems that I didn't grow up around, that I wanted to learn. And I felt really conflicted in some ways because people seemed to know what they were going to do. Oh, I'm going to study this, I'm going to study that, I'm going to become a dancer, I'm going to go into this. And a lot of that to me, I didn't have the language at the time, but somehow I knew that this was just all sort of, I probably didn't even know the term colonialism at the time, but I just felt the heaviness of that this didn't come from where, um, oh, this didn't come from where I came from. So, and so it went on to some sort of journey. <laughs> So I, I, I was here in Toronto for my first year of university and I came to York because I knew it had a good fine art program if I wanted to take that course, to go that, that route. And here, I thought this isn't the place, what I need, like what I'm to, to study, it's, it, it doesn't come from this language, it doesn't come from these disciplines. We don't have, I knew this isn't how we, 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 we live and do these things. So I, I moved back home. I thought this is where my teachers are. This is where I'll, I'll learn this, and it won't be in sort of. A, and there, there was a there was a, a university there, and uh, at the time it was Saskatchewan Indian Federated College, and it was the only. I mean, it was a internationally you know, like just groundbreaking sort of post secondary institution. Again, just governed and run by you know indigenous people, and it took place in my own community, my own backyard, right? Um, <clears throat> so. I went, the late Bob Boyer taught there in the Indigenous Fine Art Department, Edward Patra, you know, one of my instructors there. Um, and Edward had a huge influence upon me, his work, um, his installation work and sculptural work. And we've since, you know, worked together many, many times. And, um, and just to be home and connecting with, uh, it took many, many years, you know, because so much has been suppressed and was, you know, suppressed and trying to build relationships and who's speaking and teaching. And so it's just coming at a way of life and a way of being that doesn't, which to me seems quite organic and natural. Again, the thing of the freedom, the freedom and how we play, because our way in our communities and our way in everything we do is there's just there's just devilishly good playfulness and humor, you know, at so many different layers. And, and that's performance art, too. <laughs> but I guess, I mean, the term performance, whether we care about it or not, even that's sort of open. I mean, in a sense, I think of you as also as a writer and a lot of other things. And even the other night you said, oh, well, what, I, what I'm doing is really, it's a video. And I was thinking, well, that's actually, it could be a whole new media of augmented or animated, like live animated video or something, you know, if we wanted to give labels to these things, not that that's necessarily important, but, but I think there's a broader terrain of art in which we're working. But also there's, there's that sense of contemporary in the sense of we're trying to evolve a language that speaks to now that that's still connected to our communities i mean i mean you know sometimes i think i'm the freak you know i live in this world i'm i'm communicating with this world with the world i know my particular neighborhood my particular colleagues my particular set of social circumstances but what i'm doing is trying to put images out there that that for me i recognize and I'm thinking, nobody else seems to be seeing this. So I need to point it and see, maybe one other person will see and go, oh yeah, I saw that too. 
I think those things too. I, those, those, you know, the, your reality is not so com different from mine or so, so away from mine. And I think for me that's part of it is, is uh, we're trying to kind of find common language. Common language, we're a way through conflict, all of those things, you know. And, and, to, and to, 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 to claim our culture to the extent that say, yeah, I'm, I'm part of this world, but also to say, and what I have to give can also grow this world a bit, or, or, or you know, I, it's not that I have solutions, but here's my set of circumstances, here's my humanity that I want to share with my community and, and, and make, make other people feel, make myself feel I'm not alone, obviously, but make others feel maybe that they're not alone either. Yeah, um, well, you do hope that it, it contacts, or you do hope that it, it has transfers meaning or transfers ideas and, and mm -hmm. communicates. Uh, it's one of the hopes I would have. Um, and depending on the form as well, you know, using humor or satire, or uh, depending on the work as well, you know, whether the different languages that one can use to do that uh, has different forms, I suppose. But I think, and I think there's also a provocation. I would say in in, in all of your works, in different ways, uh, on different levels, because it seems to me everybody's trying to speak to multiple communities at the same time. Because there's the in community. I, I sort of was dancing on this the other day. Of like, there's people who are in the know in one way, or people who are in the know because they're your friends, or people know because they're part of the same ethnic or cultural background that you are, who are all going to relate to that work on different levels and somehow we're speaking to all of these different things that we are at once and, and, and trying to bring this very, well for me it's often confusing, all these different people I am at the same time, how to, how to make them whole in some way and, and honor all of that at once. Um, I've been thinking, for example, of Robin's work, you know, uh, the language in that video, I don't know how many people in the room that night would have known what was being said. Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't make it any less important or any less expressive, but it expresses in a different, you know, it's a provocation as well. It's saying, here's a language of this land and mm -hmm. how many of you in the room know it right now? Mm -hmm. I, I wonder if you have any you know, it's interesting that you would choose to bring that work here and show it in this context. I wonder what that means for you in terms of... Um, wow, to bring it here. Um, um, well, I just have been a bit obsessed anyway, in my own, with, uh, with learning the language and utilizing it in performance and working. And so I've just become the, yeah, in, in, in a bubble almost in working with my own writing and then working with translators and then you know, performing. I take it back to you know, a few old critics and you know the language. And so I'm just really, so I'm not really too much thinking about or haven't been who it's going to be, you know, it, why this festival, why bring this here, or, I mean, it's just my own sort of, I guess, self-indulgent sort of <laughs> process and practice in, in, in some ways, yeah. you know? I, but, I don't think it is self-indulgent. But. No, but, but, but it is true. I mean, there is a provocation, you know, there, it, 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 that, it, there is a point. Because, well, not when I first started performing and use, using Soto, absolutely, which was a different performance in live spoken Soto, that was a direct, yeah, provocation, you know, for sure. That was ch to meant to challenge that particular audience at that particular location in time, um, for sure, and brought it out there. It was just sort of throwing down the gauntlet, you know. This is, and and drawing a line about it, 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 in in enough. You come it, come understand my world now, you know. It was, but it was, but it was also a very gentle piece too. It wasn't. An angry piece, you know. It was, I guess, throwing down the gauntlet's not the right term. Then it really wasn't, you know. Maybe but it was just, it was hand. such a, yeah, you know. It was just, 
enough already. And so that was, and so this time, then on, after that, I just got into the, I had such an experience, I had such an experience doing that, very, per, well, it wasn't just personal, because I know that other audience members really felt the hair stand up on the back of their necks at that, that was in 2005 in, in Regina, and so I knew something shifted. So there was a big shift in the world all of a sudden, you know, and it's like, oh, I just tapped into something. And then I just kept going in there. And so I like, for me, I keep pursuing it. Yeah. And anyway, that language, Soto, even though it's the most best, that's the dialect out where I come from, it's the language around here, around the Great Lakes, you know, the Anishinaabe people. Yeah, it's the same place. So it fits here. <laughs> You're gonna go ahead. Uh, you know, uh, I, I, I'm wondering, I, I, I just I want to know um, about your idea of um, how important it is for you that there is something special to be understand when I look at your performance, or it's open. So you, you I, I just, you know what I mean, the relation. Yeah. Yeah, in there, I don't want to say the word message because I, I don't feel it in this way, you know, but I just want, uh, from your point, you want to, that something is understand or you want okay. No, I okay. don't want any, it does, there's no need for anything in particular okay. to be understood. I don't, okay. I don't give messages. Okay, no. <laughs> no, I, I understand what you mean. I'm totally open to interpretation. Okay. Yeah. And the other question is, um, what I'm interested in is person. You know, I told you. Yeah. And uh, when I'm looking to you, uh, um, what's your idea of the of the perf of the performance artist? Uh, sorry, it's uh, because I saw you. I, I couldn't read it really uh, because of the body projection, so I couldn't uh, really uh, see you. But when when you go down, you turned around. You know. So, uh, what, what you were doing? It's an inner process. You were, you were at, at which point? When I was yes. facing yeah, the wall? Yeah. Or? But that we are doing. But then yeah. it was for me very strong and something changed, you know. You're going down and you're finishing yes. whatever this. Uh, oh, on the floor now. I'm sitting yeah, on the floor. Yeah, going down on the floor. Mm -hmm. So, um. What is your work? I like it, you know, it's not the best. I just want to know what, what you are working, what you are doing in this moment. Um. Dropping down with her arms like this. <laughs> no, I, I know, I know. Yeah. And, and this is the thing, I mean, things aren't always necessarily thought through, right? To, no, no, to, no, to no, the no. end, eh? So what I don't know, you? but for my own experience, what am I experiencing? Yeah, what, what? Where, where are you? Where am I? Uh, I am sinking down into the ground, I think. I'm just going under the ground. Yeah. Maurice, what were you going to say there? No, I said, uh, no, I, I, it's better I don't say this. <laughs> <laughs> it's really better I don't. No. no. <laughs> so, so I'm really not going to say this. I, uh, but you know, I, maybe I am. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting you asked this. I mean, it it uh, tells something about you, of course, and this. Uh, um, and uh, I, I wonder why you wonder that. Because I'm interested how art can cover. Yeah, well, well, and that that, that is. Uh, but, but, uh, what is what is? Uh, I'm spe I thought I'm especially interested in tools. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And in approaches. So I, you know, I'm really curious how how you are, what is your. What is your work? What you, are you doing? Yeah. Of course, I see she's just doing that. But I think yeah. she has a special way, a special way to, uh, to be in the situation. And, and Jeff, I want to yeah. share about that. That's yeah. all. Yeah. It's a good question, but I think it's very hard to, to answer. Like, if you would ask me that, I, I yeah. haven't showed anything no, no. yet, so it's no. not so. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it makes one think, of course. But I think, indeed, there are so different uh, attitudes. Uh, I mean, these three here and the three yesterday and so forth. And, uh, 
um, which I think uh, makes it such a rich um, medium, is that correct? No, medium, discipline, yeah. discipline, yeah. Um, yeah, which I think is really good and it's very interesting and therefore it's interesting also for me to talk with all these people and say how they uh, uh, yeah, look in, in, in this and how they work. You know, and for me, it's really difficult to be very concrete about that. Like, I'm not concrete about many things, but um, yeah, I like uh, poetry and uh, an experimental film or uh, or uh, uh, great music, and those for me are uh, are it's 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 a big drive to do things. Like, I will try to find my own way to um, yeah, hopefully make an interesting work. And I think that for, for you, that is again very different. I mean, it's your cultural background, and it for Brian, maybe as well. Or? Um, I, I, I feel there is a certain vulnerability in talking about exactly what the performer is doing, and I'm wondering why, and I'm wondering whether this vulnerability comes from the fact that, that knowing what you do might come just during the performance and not mm -hmm. before. So through this contact, this kind of magical contact with the audience, or whether we think that knowing what we do is knowing what we do when we go in the unknown and dig something. So I, I just would like you to talk about this vulnerability around saying what was the instruction we had to ourselves, whether we knew, whether we didn't, when we figured it out. And there are facts, right? So what's the question? Okay. Yeah, sure. Just talk. Just, can you just say something about this vulnerability that there is? Yeah. Talking about our own experience. Yeah. Mm, no. <laughs> I cannot. No, I cannot. Yeah, I, I can Because of course you put yourself uh, in a very vulnerable position, uh, and uh, and maybe some uh, do not experience that uh, at all, and and their attitude to. Uh, who they are and how they are there and what they do is probably very different. But for me, it, I think it is. And I balance between this like vulnerability and sensibility, I think, in, in my work a lot. And um, yeah, well, I, I usually I have, an, I, I have an idea and for that I have objects or not. Less and less actually, but, but usually I have. And then I go out there and do it. And sometimes I have a, like a beginning and an ending and what happens in between, I'm not like totally sure of. I have thought of things, but I want to be there, look at you, think of what would make sense, you know, f for me, maybe also for you. Um, yeah, that that's a little bit my way of working, I think. Yeah. You know, because I, I think we have different approaches, you know, very different. Very, very, very so, much. So, uh, so I was very especially interested because, uh, you know, I, because I could see, I didn't see your work at all. I see uh, uh, Brian, so I could read him. Yeah. You know, I could read him. Mm -hmm. Of course, not totally, but okay, I could read him. I, and I could see her, and, and I could go on. But of course, you can. Of course, it's a possibility to say, okay, I'm lost, and I, I, I want to be lost yeah. in this moment. I, I don't have a technique. I just no. yeah. want to come into a situation that it, this would be enough for me, you know. Yeah. You, I don't say you have to have the real world. No, no, no. no, no. no. I, yeah. You know. But on the other hand, I see performance like you. How very, very precise. It's not better or worse. It's just an interest in the matter, you know, in the inner, uh, in the inner motivations, uh, how to be, how to try to touch something. That's all, you know. So if you say, okay, no, I, I, I'm not interested in this. I just want to be in calm and go. It's very okay for me. Yeah, yeah go ahead, Jill. Thanks. I like this answer that you were going into this world. Because I didn't know that. And it just it makes the piece deeper for me. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a subjective thing, right? <laughs> right. But it is interesting, this question of how we kind of score what we're going to do in our own minds, of how, yeah. how, how we sort of, okay, 
you know, sometimes it's like, well, I'm just going to go out there and see what happens. Sometimes it's like, okay, I have this orange and I know at the end it's going to be pulverized or, you know, or maybe you have very precise, exact things. You know, it can be very different for, for different artists and different, and different projects yeah. or different works. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, or even the same artist from one project to the next. I mean, for example, uh, Brian, the, the, what you were doing yesterday, which obviously is completely dependent on this kind of interaction with who passes by and how they respond to mm -hmm. the various, basically you've set up a whole series of situations, but uh, you're having a direct relationship with the audience mm -hmm. through that. I've seen other works that, more installational context where it seems to be you're working, building something, mm -hmm. people are interacting with what you're building as opposed to uh, with you yes. particularly. Yes. So those are those are two. Dip I mean that that must require a different approach to how you're thinking about. Yeah, that definitely there's a difference with the installation or install action pieces that that, that work over maybe two three days, um, building a space and a, and the sensibility and a, a, an emotional experience hopefully within a space. Um, that's a planned out process in a sense almost from the start that I kind of know a sequence of events. You know, obviously there's variations within that, but I, I'm fairly clear of the stages I might go through. Like, then I'll place the photos on these rocks, yeah, then I'll move that to that location. I, you know, and, and with experience or time, I've come up with the idea that the audience might see one element of, of the piece, and you want to put something in in five minutes or ten minutes that they can read the longer process with, so you're actually trying to get an idea across in ten minutes, but the emotional effect builds up over time. Uh, so that's a very different strategy. For, for creating a performance for, for me. Um, the piece yesterday, you know, in, in brief, um, I would have what I would call a range of possibilities. Mm. And I just decide, well, should I do this or not? On the time, like, uh, I nearly decided not to bring any other objects out, just leaves, you know, and just to try and work with the leaves. Um, and if there had been more audience, maybe at that time I would have left that. So it just depends on the situation and the moment what things you work with. And, mm -hmm. But I, I would, maybe through insecurity or fear, I would want to have a canon of opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm okay, I can always rely on that gas right. torch, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but <clears throat> and if I don't use it, that's fine. fine. <laughs> if I don't need it, it's okay. So it's, like, so it's, like a, it's like a vocabulary or a range of possibility, a range of words one can use. And if you need to be using. And um, that's the first time I've ever used video, or audio. And so for me, it was like, well, how is this a performance art piece now? You know, and I knew it was beautiful video. I loved it. I really liked it. And so then I was <laughs> thinking, you know, how do I interject myself now into this, you know, without fucking it up? <laughs> <laughs> Too much. Because, <laughs> you know, it, I just enjoyed it myself to sit and look and listen to it, right? So that was, and so I wanted, so I did have a method then. I didn't want th too much to be random, you know, maybe it's because I've never, you know, I didn't work with video, I didn't know how to, I, you know, it was, uh, so there wasn't, you know, great range of, you know, spontaneity and for, you know, for other things to happen, you know, which was very unusual for me, and I felt a little self-conscious about it, but, um, <laughs> yeah, but, so I did make it fairly, fairly set, but in other things, um, sometimes there's a beginning, sometimes there's an, you know, a, an end in sight, generally, and you don't know what'll happen in between, and sometimes there's, you just have something to work with, uh, an object, and you have, no end in sight. You don't know where it, you know, how it'll go, and it, people can walk into it and change it, and yeah, so it worked those ways too. So that was probably the most uh, constructed sort of set thing I've done. Mm -hmm. and, and Maurice, you mentioned you started off, the, what got you on the tra trajectory you're on now was actually working on video originally, if I understood correctly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was part of it, anyway. Yes, definitely. It it was a, it was an action and uh, a, a different actions, like thirty seconds with an object or mm -hmm. without an object, 
and uh, yeah, I recorded them to have a look at it myself. That was what happens. Uh, for me, that was really interesting. Um, and I have presented some of those works uh, once. Uh, I, I mentioned this before, I think, and then I saw people watching me on the screen doing this action, and somehow there would happen so much more, I think, when they were present, when the action would happen, uh, with or without failure, or, uh, I mean, there's so much more possibilities than, I mean, the recordings I did were also just one-offs. The idea, uh, rack, uh, literally, and uh, poof, and uh, stop. You know, so, so so it was a very simple beginning, but <clears throat> and I had a friend who who uh, who who performed, and he made a very strong actions, I think, and and very frequent, weekly, um, usually without any objects, and and uh, yeah, I was always in awe, like amazed that whoa, the possibilities are endless, and uh, yeah, for me that was a great drive to think of. Uh, yeah, how to extend myself a little bit, yeah. But I have to also say, because I'm, I'm very often very confused ab about many things, <laughs> uh, but it's really great to, to, to meet and to talk to people, because it gives you a little insight in them, and you self-reflect on them, so it's like this ongoing process of uh, yeah, learning about your own abilities and disabilities, and, and experiencing the other ones, and yeah. Yeah, and I, I used to um, yeah, work on objects. I really say used to because I don't do that at all anymore. I used to also draw a lot. And when I started uh, um, doing actions, I, I prefer to call them actions, for me it was natural to bring uh, blocks of wood because I could uh, work on them with tools, which I really like. And, uh, and then it kind of yeah, grew and you drop things on the way and you pick up new things, I think. And therefore you're always vulnerable. Which I also like, because if you're too confident about it, maybe then you lose a little bit this... Uh, at least I, I have had that, that I did an action which I knew from the beginning to the end, and then I did it uh, again elsewhere, and it's not the same thing. You know, that for me, it, it kind of broke a little bit off. And I do like to... Uh, I have an idea, I go and do it, and maybe I know that I can afterwards, uh, that I can maybe... Uh, um, perfection it a little bit, or, or, or that I just uh, take uh, certain elements from that and try to bring them further again, so it's like this confused all the time, you know, that, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I live off that a little bit. But it sounds like those, the, the way you described those early actions, you know, and it said, oh, it, it almost sounds like it was accidental or a byproduct that there was this video that other people could see. It sounds like you were just kind of playing or experimenting. No, it was very much playing, yeah. And yeah. you just and, wanted and to see for yourself what it would look like yeah. as opposed to, okay, I'm going to do this and then the video will be an art piece or yeah. something like and that. And I'm very much uh, afraid to lose that playfulness too, that it really starts becoming a thing. And, uh, and sometimes I think I, uh, I, I have friction with that. And I think maybe that's very recognizable for others, at least I hope so. And um, yeah, it starts questioning, uh, you, you doubt about things. And uh, the year before, I, I, I had the opportunity to perform uh, regularly. So I did a lot and you, you experience a lot and you, I was very free. And then I didn't do something for a long period at all. And the bridge really gets longer and longer. I, I thought that maybe I cannot do this anymore or so. And, um, yeah, which I tend to believe that that's not uh, true. <laughs> <laughs> so how long was that break? That break was, uh, well, I I, the last time I performed, uh, I performed uh, three weeks ago or so, I think, but that was the first time since uh, last November, so that's almost a year. Yeah, and the year that before that I performed uh, every month somewhere, except the month June, I think I remember. And um, yeah, that was really good at the time. I, uh, I practically take every uh, opportunity I get to, to perform. But uh, yeah, in the end of the year, I was also really like, a, you know, it, it, it was just really a lot. And it, w it felt really good to know that I didn't have things coming, that I wouldn't be like on and on and on and on. 
um, because the year before that I also regularly performed, but, but a little less anyway. So I was happy to be off, but then also, uh, yeah, I started to be very insecure that, uh, yeah, I would like to do something. What am I going to do? How am I going to do that? Where am I going to do that? <laughs> and, uh, you know. I mean, this, I've gone through the same thing, so it's nice to hear you say that. But then, are there ways that, to make a performance without an invitation? Like, you can perform on the street. I don't really do perform on the street. I, I, I haven't done it yet, maybe I should try. But other than that, I don't know when to perform, unless maybe for a video camera. Someone told me that that's helpful. But do you guys, if, without an invitation, can you just set up a performance somewhere? Or do you, or how do you? I have twin daughters. <laughs> um, they teach you a lot. Uh, they teach. They taught me a lot about spontaneity and um, how an action or a, a, re a reaction to a situation can change things. Um, so I have learned a lot from them, um, and also I think working with students has been great, and also working in group situations, um, you know, uninvited situations. Have learned and you know I've found you know um, possibilities for things you know that that I take home with me and think about and use the object and look and do stupid things in the studio and you know, so well and play. Also, one thing Be Beyond I think was doing was I, I think it was monthly that you just yeah. sort of all get together, choose a location sure. anywhere, just show up and. Yes, this started, uh, Sinead O'Donnell started a process in Belfast with um, younger artists. She, she I think, f naturally felt that there was a gap between us old fogies, um, <laughs> including a few other artists, um, and the younger generation coming through, and that there was maybe a gap of, of, of how the younger ones weren't getting experience. So she started a, a monthly meeting, uh, which ran for about six months or a year, something like this, eight months. Um, and then Be Beyond said it was a great idea, and, and you know we turned up and worked with her. And then she kind of handed it over or let it run with, with Be Beyond, and it's been quite successful, I think, in a in a way of keeping you know young graduate students involved and and letting them try things out and without the risk of failure, too much failure or fear in public and in. The, Right, because they're not like published events of like no, this day then. there'll be an event that, and there's a poster and a public's called it's yeah. it's more but but there's a support there's other artists who are yes. going to be working so yes. you're all working in a location. Yes. So you pick a, every month to pick a location and people turn up at a time and, and just start working together and yes. um, so, you know sometimes there are visitors from from other countries at the time to like last week Kurt Johannesson um, came and did something and. So it, it just depends on the decision of the group where to meet next. And yeah. then the individuals can choose to bring something or not. Some people turn up with nothing and just respond to what the situation is. Um, some people carry and test a piece out with the others. So it's a great, it's a good, it's a great um, playful way to, to, to help the, well help myself and you know, the younger artists get that experience. So I saw Andrew and then Jürgen both had comments. Her. Okay, Jürgen, go ahead. Well, I'll defer to you. I have to do much because you uh, focus, uh, uh, I think, the fourth time on, on age. So mm -hmm. I, <laughs> I ask you, uh, what does the age uh, is important for you in your art? And does your age change your approach? Interesting question. Um, is it, uh, I'm not so sure in the art about age. I don't know about that. Um, my approach, I think, yes, sometimes maybe it's tactically to do things and, and maybe you have knowledge of past experience to decide to do something or that something is required, you know, in Belfast or or among others, there's maybe something that needs to happen now, we have to take care of this. So, so yes, in some ways, I, tactically or strategically, age is important, but I don't know about inside the practice. Physically, yes, maybe. Yeah. You know, I'm big now and not looking after myself so well, uh, perhaps, uh, and I find perhaps that physically I mightn't be as able to do extreme physical things 
that I maybe could do five years ago. Mm -hmm. And that I would just be a little careful, I think, of what I can do now physically. That's all. Maybe that's the only thing. But otherwise, I don't think so. Here. Robin, you look like something's. Oh, I'm just thinking about what you're talking about. Uh, um, you know, when you have this leaving behind sort of your practice for a while, and then, and also the thing about just how do you perform when you're not invited, or where do you? It seems like this need, you know need for 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 more playtime, you know, and that's how I think of it. Um, and I don't know. I'm just thinking about it because I did go through a period for about the last two and a half years where I really didn't create or do much and it was a very, very conscious decision and I had no clue if I ever was ever even going to do any kind of art practice again. I mean, it was really kind of a big break and, and, and walk off into a whole other kind of realm. And it was, it was really scary for me. It was really upsetting and scary, and, but I, I, I just had to kind of trust it and thought, well, if it comes back, it comes back. If it doesn't, it doesn't, right? I've got to do something else right now. And so, um, um, apparently, apparently it's back. <laughs> 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 but um, yeah, it was a good almost two and a half year break there. Uh, from doing much. Well, that's not entirely true. I mean, I got, I didn't create new work. I got invited to a, a couple of things and I just brought some old work, but I wasn't going to create anything new. It was like, get invited, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll do that, but that's it. Um, so I'm just thinking about that and just, because I know I'm, I'm really struggling for time and space and trying to figure out ways for just to really dive in, you know, nice and deep into uh, performing and how you keep things that that alive, but you know, in your in your everyday and yeah, try street performing is great. I mean, that, that's that's it's wonderful just to go do some spont something spontaneous out there, you know, and that's that's one way, which I started off with. Long yeah, I ago. was about to add there uh, because for me, um, it's again the attitude. I have worked a few times on the on the street, and I'm completely lost. I'm completely lost. Yeah. I need, and, and that is because of my way of working. I, I have uh, figured out that I like the safety of that uh, there's a closed space. You are here, I am here, and uh, so I demand a lot of attention, or at least I believe so myself. <laughs> that that, uh, that, that if, I, if, I, if I would uh, d have these uh, similar works on the street, it wouldn't, you know, people come and go, and it's different. So uh, when. Uh, I had to think of like a durational thing, some, something that makes sense, but that uh, is, is an eye catcher or so. So it's, it was it was ridiculous thoughts, and uh, yeah. Well, I wanted to comment that on it because maybe it's great to indeed go out on the street, but it would uh, you know it would scare shit out of me uh, to uh, go out. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, I think we, I'm we more comfortable out there. <laughs> Morris, we Sorry. will collaborate on the street. Yeah. <laughs> So that maybe. So that's for you. Is the sorry for, for for Brian. It's the complete opposite. At least with no, the, with I, this. I face sometimes the same fear. You know, like uh, shit. Is this going to work? You know. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's. Uh, but I like that too. That, that you know, even yesterday yeah. in the morning. But for me, I experience it as a, being a disability. That uh, that uh, I, I can maybe do this, but only under these conditions. Yeah. What is this? No. <laughs> <laughs> so I see Andrew and TL both. Hands are jumping a bit, so Andrew, go ahead and then. Um, this focus on the street and in a public domain more than a more private space than a gallery or a theater or whatever seems to me to be a question of performance's relation to the everyday. And there are those, of course, folks who think that, well, the everyday is performative. Mm -hmm. you know, brushing teeth, shaving is performance. It, you know, it is performative, if not performance per se. I was wondering if any of you think in terms of doing a piece in a public realm that seems like the everyday, except maybe one or two details are slightly off, and that causes people to wonder what exactly they're encountering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought uh, <coughs> thought about that, and um, you know, nearly, yeah. Well, you could say uh, the piece yesterday yeah, was that. I was that going to say, you know, <laughs> the, the, with the leaves, it was almost like that, you know, that it was just this, this, this ordinary, just by putting something ordinary on a table. 
and uh, in the context it became something else. So. But yes, um, I, th I think sometimes to try things to test, you know, and sometimes you can only do that in public. You, you know, you can think about it um, intellectually. You can think about what it might be and how it might work, but really to test something in the uh, with the space or the audience is where you learn. And I like that. You know, I'd like to to try something and to ch to test it and see if it works. Yeah, I was almost expecting it to be more integrated with the proof vendors. Um. Yeah, well, I have a piece called um, Genetic Experiment, uh, which I didn't bring out. Um, and it, it uses um, the oddest looking fruit and veg mm. and um, with bits of electronics. And uh, <laughs> kind of, so yes, I, I can. If I had been close to the veg, closer to the veg store, that possibly I would have had that integration. And there would have been something with it. Um, I think uh, I, just because it keeps popping into my, my memory here, my mind, coming, um, was a piece that, uh, that happened and um, I guess the performative sort of everyday thing and there was a big gathering that took place out in the Capel Valley, it's a beautiful stretch of valley, it's Treaty 4 territory, like that's where I'm from, like treaties were signed and so the number of different reserves there and um, <clears throat> big, big uh, national treaty gathering. So, various chiefs and leaders, you know, leadership from all over meeting there. Um, and when they do have entertainment, uh, um, it tends to be fairly conventional sort of, uh, you know, um, entertainment. You know, dinner and a comedian, stand-up comedian, or dinner and you know, some singer. So. <clears throat> Uh, over the four days of that convention, myself and Edward Putra and uh, Linnae Coos, Dal Sieben, we, we camped and spent the four days out there and you know, brought different equipment and had some ideas about what we wanted to do on certain things and some, some art actions you know, around the... And it took place at the, the, the powwow grounds there and they have a big governance centre, but anyhow... Um, so I had this idea in mind of something I wanted to do of writing on the hillsides, and I brought how was it? I brought one of those you know baseball diamond maker things. Those are the things you pull and the chalk. Um, <clears throat> but we were really we we were located we and we had ourselves and you know, we just wanted to we didn't want to be really obtrusive and we did the white cube van thing and we wore our work overalls and you could just fit in there with all the other workers. It was a huge gathering, um, and. We did some site-specific sort of installation stuff, um, and but with this thing, it was quite nice. Uh, um, one of the I don't know what his position would have been, but one of the head guys there in charge of uh, sort of the overseeing the parking and the the, the powwow grounds there, because there was going to be a big powwow too as part of the as part of it. And usually, when you go to powwows. The parking, like unless it's like a, a rural powwow, you know, you just all drive on the grass and figure out where you're going to, you know, park. Um, there's no set parking arrangements. But so it was funny because he found out, I don't know how, he found out that we had this chalk thing and he asked us if we, or did he ask us? No, he didn't ask us. We asked him. Yeah, we came to the idea. Um, if he would mind if we would do draw parking lines and which was very odd and he he was very uh, thrilled with his idea so we spent you know a good four or five hours on this massive area with power's going to be drawing you know chalk parking lines and it's hilarious to watch people come in because it's never happened before <laughs> all of a sudden you know everybody's coming in for the powwow and you know and they're on the dirt and the grass with these chalk lines for parking and so it was just this nice little thing was sort of, maybe not exactly, but just sort of every day and yeah. spontaneous and something uh, simple. Like and you've never seen such organized parking at any power. It's <laughs> 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 very nice. <clears throat> so TL, did I see your hand up earlier? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Actually, I want to thank you all for a beautiful conversation and discussion. It's really nice. But I actually want to respond to your question about the invitation. And um, I don't know if you know Dana McLeod, who's a Canadian um, uh, open access space in, um, in, in Montreal, and she's a video and performance artist. Anyway, she's got this really great project, and I wanted to tell you about it, 
um, because we mentioned maybe certain to perform the video, and it's a perfect substitute for video pickup, and it's like a standing invitation for artists to submit a video per week and have them um, published automatically through user generated thing on um, the 52 video pickup site that she has. And they have, um, they have lots of different kinds of people doing lots of different kinds of video, but one of the things that you can do is you can like videotape a performance or think about developing a performance for video. And they're, they're short performances, like anywhere from like three seconds to four minutes. But what you can do is you can do like half hour performance or whatever and cut it into a little chunk and then have like seven weeks of so whatever. I can send her a video every week and she'll put it up? Yeah, and the other thing that's really great about it is that you have an automatic audience because there are other people who are doing it. And so not, there are people who are doing it every week as well because they're looking at the, um, at the videos. And, um, and then there's lots of people who just kind of come to look or whatever mm -hmm. for you. Um, and then the other thing that's really awesome about it is that you're also developing performances. <laughs> so anyways, I just wanted to tell you oh, and everyone about that. Yeah. Just because, yeah, it's just 50 to 52 video pickup and Google it and you'll find her. And um, and she's open to lots of different kinds of stuff. So, that's good. Yeah. yeah. Great. Um, I think we're coming up to 2 o'clock, so uh, unless there's any last burning comments that you guys want to offer obviously not not, not, not in this <laughs> we, can, we can do that uh, afterwards anyway <laughs> are you deflating <laughs> no it didn't work <laughs> it's a long way it's a, a duration <laughs> So I want to thank you all for joining us today. The next Performance Art Daily will be on Tuesday. Uh, Monday is a dark day for the festival, except for Karen Elaine Spencer, who continues to inhabit the Via Rail train station from 9 to 5 each day. Uh, later this afternoon, we have at 4 o'clock across the street at Mercer Union, uh, the afternoon program for today. So thank you all uh, for joining us today. <laughs>